Okay, so last time, this is where we stopped. So last time we were discussing about the uh, line spectra and in your syllabus, we mostly talk about the line spectra of hydrogen. And if you read your resource book, you will realize that we are mostly talking about emission spectra rather than absorption spectra. But I believe you are aware that about the difference between the absorption spectra and the emission spectra. In the emission spectra, like the one given here, <clears throat> You have a dark background and you have bright lines. That is the emission spectra. And in the absorption spectra, you would have the reverse. You will, you will have a bright background and you will have dark lines in the place where there is uh, absorption. And last time we looked at how to relate these spectral lines into the electron transitions. So in the case uh, of the emission spectra, this is emission spectra, you can see all the arrows are coming down. The arrows are coming down, meaning that the electron went up to an upper shell or upper level is coming back down. When it is coming back down, it is emitting radiation. So it is that radiation you see as this uh, spectral line number four. And the radiation emitted by the spectral line one is what you saw here as the red line. So what, what if this was an absorption spectra? What we hear is the emission spectra. If it is a, uh, the absorption spectra, then this transition is not downwards. It, instead of coming from any level to N1, the transition would be from N1 to any level. So it would go like that. In that case, again, you can relate the same things. This is spectral line one only that this would appear as a black line in a colored background. So if this was a, an uh, absorption spectra, let's see, this is the absorption spectra. So you have a bright background. This spectral line or the transition number one will appear as a black line here. So this is again your spectral line number one as shown here. So that is uh, kind of summing up where we stopped last time. All right, now today we are going to take it a little bit further. Here, what I have shown you is the uh, Barmer series. And you have to know Barmer series is partly visible. In the hydrogen spectra, we notice only four spectral lines. Those are from the visible region. There is another spectra. If we want, we can put another spectra as a, a transition coming from another level above. <clears throat> If it is coming like that, now that line is going to have a much higher energy, the spectral line five. And this line will fall in the UV region, while the others are in the visible. So because of that, we can call Barmer series as partly visible. We have some visible part and we cannot see UV, UV radiation with our naked eye. So that is the uh, invisible part in the Barmer series. Now we are taking this one step further and I'm going to draw a similar type of spectral lines and energy levels. 
this is my uh, energy level. I'm going to mark it as one, uh, the N equals one. <clears throat> now today we are actually coming into what this N is and going to talk in greater details. N is actually a whole number. <clears throat> it's a positive whole number. Uh, it actually mentions the allowed orbits. So n is a whole number and it, it shows the allowed orbits or the allowed levels, like energy levels. And then we have n equals uh, two. And n one, is actually the uh, energy level or the orbit that is closest to the nucleus. And where is your nucleus? You can assume your nucleus is somewhere here. So that is your nucleus. And then as this N number increase, you will see that the energy levels are getting further away from the nucleus and their energies are going to increase. So in this direction, you can see energy increasing. So I'm going to keep drawing my and levels and you can see that these levels get closer and closer as we increase the n number so i'm going to draw uh, some uh, transitions here yeah, I'm going. Just four transitions. I'm going to label them as one, two, three, and four. And then I'm going to do another set of transitions. I will number them five, six, seven, and eight. All right, now if I, in the previous one, we looked at just one series. In, in this one, we are going to look at a couple of series. Um, so looking at the transition, do you think you can name them as Lyman, Balmer, or Parshen? How do you know the difference? You have to check from where to where the transition happened. So if you consider the first set of transitions, you can see things are coming to level one. So that is our Lyman series. And this one is going to be our Balmer. If you have another set, that would look like this. That would be our passion series. And for this, if you are trying to do the line spectra,
on the left end, I'm going to put the smaller lambda. Smaller wavelength. And on the other side, I'm going to put the large wavelengths. So you can see the wavelength increase in this direction. And then, do you think uh, you can figure out how these spectral lines should appear in this line spectral diagram? We have, first we look at the Lyman series. Now we know that Lyman series is actually in the uh, UV region. This is in the UV region. If you think about the electromagnetic spectrum that we have looked earlier, you see that UV radiation comes before the visible light. So UV radiation actually have a smaller wavelength compared to uh, the visible light. So this is a small lambda. So you can expect the spectral lines towards the smaller end of the spectrum. And we can mark these spectral lines like this. Note that how they, how they have spacing from small wavelength as you increase, you can see that the spacing between two lines is going to gradually increase. And then our Balmer series will also appear like this. And if we have our caution, that will also appear like this. <clears throat> now in this ribbon we have shown here as our line spectra, you can see three sets of series. This is one series of line. That is the second series of line. This one is the third series of line. So this is one series of lines. This is another series of lines. So we can call the first series as the Lyman because it is towards the smaller wavelength region. And the second one as the Barman series. And the third one as the Harshan series. And now relating the spectral lines from one to another. The spectral line number four. Within the Lyman series, spectral line number four has the highest energy difference, highest energy transition. And then recall the relationship between uh, energy, frequency, and wavelength if you go if you have a very high energy that means you should have a smaller wavelength so relating the spectral lines from one to another this one is our transition number four and what is this line that is our number one line. So what this number one line means is that the transition occur from N2 to N1. So you can identify them like that. And our, I'm just randomly picking colors. They have no relationship to the colors because you are basically talking about 
UV region. Now the spectral line number three, you can relate that to this transition. And the spectral line number two, it's that transition. So what is the uh, spectral line number two? It is from N3. So you can see N3 to N1. And the spectral line number three, that is from N4 to N1. So you can identify them like that. If you go into the Barmer series again, now you can identify this spectral line labeled as number five. Within the Barmer series, you can say that the transition number five has the smallest energy. So that means within this set of transitions, the transition five should show a relatively higher wavelength. So this one is the transition number five. So what exactly is the transition? The transition occur from N2, uh, sorry, N3 to N2. So the transition is from N3 to N2. So your initial is N3 and the final transition occurs to the N2 level. So this is where your electron was, that is initial N2 is your final. All right. So that is basically uh, what I wanted to go over this time before going into our next topic. Now let's do a little concept check. Concept check. I'm going to draw a line spectra. So check how many series are here. And what are they? As if Lyman, Balmer, Parson. So I'm going to put it, uh, let's say I'm going to put this is uh, from lambda, this side, it is going to increase. If that is the case, you can see you have one, two, three, four, five series. So those are the series and from the set of series that you already know, you can say that the highest energy series is the Lyman series. That first one is Lyman, which is in the UV region. The second one is Palmer. Third one is Parson. Palmer is partly visible, portion is IR, fourth one is 
bracket that is also IR and the last one is that is also IR. So we cannot see any UV light or the IR radiation. So we cannot see any of these transitions um, without uh, a special equipment. We cannot see them with our naked eye. All right. So the same way, if we have things given, now this is lambda I have given. And be able to uh, relate lambda to frequency. We know that our lambda and frequency are inversely related. So that means if this is a, a small lambda, in other sense, it means this is a high frequency. All right, so um, next, we are going to go into uh, the shapes of orbitals. So now let's look into uh, the shapes of orbitals. So the previous part was uh, basically about uh, the spec hydrogen spectra and trying to relate it with the uh, Bohr model. So the Bohr model could actually explain the line spectra because uh, together with uh, Max Planck's uh, idea about quantization of energy, because we have the spe specific spectral line, uh, they were able to prove that the electrons are actually in particular energy levels. So uh, when it comes for uh, talking about orbitals, we, we should, I think, first think about orbit uh, and orbital. What is the difference between orbit and orbital? So the orbit actually gives you a certain uh, general path that you will find the electron. So let's say you have the nucleus like this, and this is what is an orbit is like. That means our electron is actually moving in this path. So the orbit basically means the uh, path electron revolves. And what orbital, orbital means is that the most probable area in the space where we can find the electron. So this is the most probable area to find electron. So it is more like an electron density. how much electron density there is. So when you think about a certain density or most probable area, uh, you can narrow it down. Let's say the path is like from your home to your school. So that is the path, but let's say between your home and school, there is a particular place 
you usually hang out a little bit more. So the orbit is, uh, sorry, orbital is something like this. An area that you might spend most time between uh, in this path. So same way with electrons and atoms, the electron keep on moving in the path, but there are certain places that electrons spend more time. So we call them as the orbitals. And we have different types of orbitals. We are going to look into them one by one. So the first type of orbital we are going to look into is the uh, S orbital. The S stands for sharp. Actually, you don't need to memorize these names, but it makes more sense if you know what the letter stands for. These orbitals are more of a spherical shape, not circle. Circle and spherical are two different things. Circle is a flat thing. Sphere is like a three-dimensional thing. So think about a cricket ball or a, a soccer ball. So S orbital has a spherical shape. And S orbital is seen in all n levels. So that means we know n levels. There's n1. We know about n2. n1 being the closest level to the nucleus. So if we have an S orbital, in level one or n equal one, we can call it uh, the one s indicating. So this one indicating the n or the level. If it is in the second level, we can call it two s indicating the n level. If it is in level three, we can call it 3s. Now, if this is this spherical shape is where the most probable area to find the electron, where is our nucleus? Think about the center of a, of a cricket ball or a soccer ball. Think about center. So let's draw the axis. Like the Cartesian axis. This as x, y, and z. You know all this x, y, and z, these are in perpendicular angles to each other. And where is your nucleus where this x, y, and z meet? So this is where you have your nucleus, the red dot. Right. Now, if I line up the one S from N1 level and the two S from level two and the three S from level three, I can draw the relative sizes like this. So they have, they all have the X, Y, and the Z axis. So you can see as the N level keeps on increasing, the size of that orbital is also going to increase. So in each case, 
you will find your nucleus in the center where you have your X, Y, and Z axis meeting. So make sure you know that S is seen in all N levels. So the next type of orbital we are going to look into is the P orbital. P stand for principle. This orbital type is found in N levels beyond two. So that means in N equals one, there is no P orbitals. N two and onwards. You will find P orbitals. So similar to the previous ones, if you have uh, p orbitals in n equals two, we can call them as two p. If it is in n level three, we can call it three p, and it can go so on and so forth. All right. Now these p orbitals. We call them as degenerate. In general communication, degenerate means something else. But in chemistry, we use this word degenerate to say same energy. We look into this piece of information uh, when we start drawing energy diagrams, but I'm going to keep that point aside for now. So when it says degenerate, there should be more than one type because we are saying they are same energy. If there is only one thing, of course, there's only uh, same energy. For example, in S orbitals, S orbitals, you have only one type of S orbitals. It's just S because your S orbital, you can see it's uh, go, uh, the center is uh, like in the middle and your, your spherical orbital is uniformly spread around it. In the P orbital, we have three types of p orbitals. We have three types of p orbitals. The general shape of a p orbital is like a dumbbell shape, like this. If you have seen those dumbbells that is used for exercising like weights, they kind of look like this. So pretty much that's it, that shape. So we call them as the dumbbells. The dumbbell shape. Now drawing these uh, three types of P orbitals. Again, I'm going to draw the Cartesian planes. I have my X axis the y-axis and the z-axis. One type of p orbital lie along the x-axis. So we can call that as px. And the other type of p orbital is going to lie 
along the y-axis. We can call it py. And the next type of p orbital, we can draw it on the z axis. So we can call it the pz. Now I have drawn them separately, but when we put it in uh, real representations, they are in one diagram. So it will look kind of like this. You have the X, Y, Z. In some places, you might see that this Y and Z axis is switched. So as long as you have uh, these things in a perpendicular angle to each other, that's fine. And as long as you have named them properly, and also uh, as long as you have labeled them properly, that's what matter. All right, so let's put all the three orbitals into one picture. This is what my PX is going to look like. And then my PY is like this. And then the PZ. So it, it kind of looks complicated, but you have to be able to draw this because it's going to be uh, used in the coming chapters, particularly when we are talking about hybridization and topics like that. So again, similar to the S orbitals, I mentioned that as you go from N1 to N2 to N3, your size of the S orbital increase. Similarly, the P orbital size is also going to increase. For example, if this first picture is, uh, let's say if it is the 2P, my 3P will look even bigger than this. It can look bigger than uh, the 2P. So I believe you get the idea. Next, we are going to look into the other orbital types. We have something called the D orbitals. So here you see D stands for diffuse. We have five of them. So what are the five D orbitals? They are here. You don't have to draw them. We are not in the A levels. So far we are not doing the D and F orbital drawing, but you have to draw, you, you should be able to draw the S and P. So you don't need to draw any of these, only know that there's five of them. So this is the first one, second one, third, fourth, and fifth. And all five of them have same energy. So I can show it instead of showing it as complicated drawings, I, I can show it as boxes. So I have five boxes, each box showing the orbital. So when we draw boxes in place of orbitals, we can call them box orbital diagrams. And 
down here, you see a set of some other orbitals. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. These are the F orbitals. F stand for fundamental. So again, for F orbitals, you don't have to draw any of these uh, shapes. All you need to know that there are seven orbitals of equal energy. So if you are doing a box orbital diagram for F, it will look like seven boxes attached to each other. So each box representing one orbital. Now, we need to know a few more information. Now, each of these orbitals can hold up to two electrons. Each orbital can hold a maximum of two electrons. We saw S orbitals, which are spherical. This can hold two electrons. And then we saw P orbitals in three different orientations in angles. Each can hold two electrons. So that means together they can hold a maximum of six electrons in P. And then for D, we saw five orbitals. In each orbital, you can hold two electrons. So that means all the D orbitals together can hold a maximum of 10 electrons. And then the F, again, each orbital can hold two electrons. Since there are seven orbitals in F, F can hold a maximum of 14 electrons. So you have to know these numbers because it's going to be very uh, useful in the coming chapters. All right. Now, in the Bohr model, if you can recall, in the Bohr model, that is where we started using N. This introduced N, which is a whole number, which indicate the levels that our electrons are allowed to stay. So that means uh, according to Bohr model, you have the nucleus, you can have N1, or you can have N2. And what it means by allowed levels is that if you have your electron like this, the electron can stay either level one, n equal one, or it can go to n equal two, but it's not allowed to stay in between. It cannot stay in between. So that's what it means by allowed levels. So either one level or the other, not anywhere in between. 
Now, when it comes for the uh, quantum mechanical model, we are going to talk about uh, more, more type of letters, which we call as quantum numbers. So we are going to talk about a little bit more uh, into these quantum numbers. This is also a type of quantum number. N is one type of a quantum number, and we are going to look into a set of other quantum numbers given as L, ML, and MS. All these are quantum numbers and they describe the orbitals and the electrons. So these quantum numbers, they are going to describe orbitals and electrons, the electrons in the orbit, orbit and the orbitals. So let's go uh, and check what these quantum numbers are one by one. So in the recent years, if you check the past papers, you will find uh, at least one question coming from this part. So this part is kind of very important. The first type of uh, quantum number we are going to talk about is N, which you kind of already know. We call this as the principal quantum number. The principal quantum number. This defines the energy level or the shell. So this defines the energy level, energy level, or we can call it as shell. As we saw earlier, you have the nucleus, you have energy level one, and you can have energy level two and so on. So as this N level increases, their energies are going to increase. N level one is the level with lowest energy. This level is the level or the shell with lowest energy. And you can recall that this N is always a positive integer. It's a positive integer, meaning a, a positive whole number. It start with n equals one. So it's always whole numbers. The next type of quantum number we are going to look into is L. The simple L which we call as the angular momentum quantum number or the azimuthal quantum number. Angular momentum quantum number or Azimuthal quantum number. So this quantum number actually uh, describes the shape of the orbital. It can describe the shape.
And this quantum number, since they say it's a quantum number, it should have a certain type of numerical figure. So how do we get that numerical figure? It goes from zero to N minus one. So L, the angular quantum moment number, it defines the shape of the orbital or in other words, we can uh, say, uh, define the sublevel. A while ago, we saw N. N defines the energy level. L defines the sublevel. Sub in addition, it can say the shape. So how exactly do we get this? Uh, L, the numerical value for L. So I mentioned it goes from zero to N minus one. Let's start with N equals one. If N is equal to one, L is going from zero, technically zero, to n minus one. What is n minus one? It is one minus one, again gives zero. So the, for n equals one, L becomes zero. Let's take another one, n equals two. So for n equals two, we have to take, if we want to find L, we have to take it from zero to n equal one. Now our n is two minus one is one. So we have to take whole numbers from zero to one. So here, take all numbers, zero to one. So what are the whole numbers? You have zero to one, it's zero and one itself. I will put it. You get zero and you get one. If you have n equals three, what do you get? You have zero, two, and minus one, which is three minus one is a two. So you should get numbers from zero to two. Zero, one, two. Okay. If you want, you can go and do it for n equals four. If you do n equals four, you will get numbers from zero, one, two, three, four. All right. Now, when L is zero, we define it as the S orbital. So every time you have a zero, that is an S orbital. So it can define spherical shape. So now it's like you're learning chords. We are going to identify electrons using certain chords. And if our L value is equal to one that is going to be a p orbital. So every time you see L equals one, that is p. And 
and if we have L equals two, that is D. Now you can imagine what is going to be uh, L equals four. If you have an L equals to uh, four, that would be the F orbitals. All right. So uh, now we kind of have an idea about two types of quantum numbers, the principal quantum number N and the angular, con uh, angular momentum quantum number, which is L. Okay. Now next, uh, we, we are going to look into uh, the magnetic moment, uh, the magnetic quantum number. which we give as ML. So this uh, actually describe the orientation. The magnetic quantum number is going to describe the uh, orientation. So earlier we looked into uh, what L is. You have certain L values. L can be either zero or it can be zero one or zero one two. And it can go on like that. So now this is not about L, this is about ML. So now we again have to get a certain numerical value for ML. How do we get it? It goes from minus L to plus L, including zero. What does that mean? Let's say we have L which is zero. Our ML now has to be going from minus L through zero all the way to a plus L value. For zero, do you have a minus zero and a plus zero thing? We don't. We don't have a such thing as a minus zero or a plus zero. For the zero, you have zero itself. Now let's take L equals one. When L equals one, our MLs can become minus one, zero, and plus one. If we have L equals two, our L is two, so we go through from negative two, negative one, zero, plus one, and plus two. And if we have L equals three, we go through negative three to a positive three through zero. A while ago, we saw what actually L means. L is a chord, stand for S. So L, L equals zero, stand for S. L equals one, stand for P. L equals two is D and L equals four is F. So we can relate things now. L equals one is P, this is D, and this is F. Remember that 
when I was introducing SPDF orbitals, I mentioned that S has only one orbital. P has three orbitals. Now these are the three orbitals. One orbital is minus one, the other one is zero. The other one is a plus one. For D, there were five orbitals. So you have, if you count, this is one, two, three, four, five. So we have different quantum numbers for each orbital. And for F, we said there are seven orbitals and count how many you have. You have uh, seven orbitals. All right. So that kind of nicely line up with what we learned earlier. Next, we are going to look into the uh, last type of quantum number, which is spin quantum number. Which we give the symbol MS. <clears throat> the word says it, spin. So this indicate different types of spins of electron. So we are looking at the spins of electrons. Remember electrons, they're, they're negative charge. And when we are trying to pair up electrons, if you are trying to put two electrons together, you might have heard, learned from your all levels that when you are making a bond, you're putting two electrons together to make a covalent bond. So if the electrons are of same charge and if the, if the same charges are repelling each other, how can you put two things together that repel? So how they come together is by their spins. By having different spin orientations, they can create opposite magnetic fields. So at the end, how the electrons attract to each other is not through their uh, charge. It's not through the negative charge because the two negative charge repel each other. The way they keep together is by having opposite spins. So they, they create opposite magnetic field and the magnetic field at the end uh, attract. So we uh, in the quantum model we say that the electrons are going to have opposite spins so in order to show that opposite spins we use plus or minus and we use a half so one electron can have the plus half and the other one can have a minus half now we can uh, kind of put all these things into uh, a summary. So let's see if we can sum up everything. First, we learned about the principal quantum number, which tells you about the uh, level or the shell. And then we have L, which tells you about shape. And then we have ML, and then we have the MS. This is spin, and the other one is orientation. And also, we know how to get ML. It goes from uh, negative L, zero, to positive L and MS, it is going to be either a plus or minus half. Right. In level one, when our N equals to one, 
in our first level, we have only s orbitals. And we know uh, L is actually uh, zero to N minus one. So if our N is one, our L is going to be zero. What zero means is that we are looking at S orbital. And our ML is also going to be zero. And then if we are having one electron, the first electron can be a plus half and the other electron can be a minus half. Then let's look at level two. For level two, L is zero to N minus one. So it's either zero or one. If it is zero, we have S. If it is one, it is E. And then we are going to have the ML values. This is zero. This is negative one, zero to positive one. And then we can have plus or minus. Now this table, if I try to put plus or minus, it is going to get very complicated because for, I'm just showing how complicated it can get. For this one, again, you can have uh, a plus half and a minus half. And for each of these, you can have a plus half and a minus half. And then for this, again, you can have a plus half and a minus half. And this also, you can have a plus half and a minus half. So because it is going to make too complicated and messy, I'm going to remove that. But if you want, you can put that down in your notes. All right. Next, we'll look into N equals three, the L values is zero, one, two, which gives us S, P, and D. And the numbers we get is ML, zero. This is negative one, zero, positive one. And for D, that is negative two, negative one, zero, plus one, and plus two. Level four, your L is zero to N minus one, which is zero to one, two, and three. So you're going to have S, P, D, F. And you will have this. Now think about how many uh, total orbitals and total electrons you can actually get from this. The total number of orbitals.
for s how many orbitals do you see this is just one orbital here you see only one uh, one type so in the first level you have a total of one orbital in level one and then consider level two how many orbitals you have you have one here and two three four so you have a total of four orbitals next one in the level three how many do you have it's one two three four five six seven eight nine and then the next one here one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen you have a total of 16 orbitals. Now, if you really try to build some sort of a numerical relationship between n and the total number of orbitals, do you think you can build something? When n is one, total number of orbitals one. When n is two, total number of orbitals four. n is three, total number of orbitals, nine. Doesn't this look like a relationship of n squared? One of one is, sorry, one of two, that is one. In the second case, our n is two, two to the power two, that is four. In the second case, our n is three, and square of that is nine. In the third case, we have n as four, so four to the power two, we get 60. So n squared will give you the total number of uh, orbitals. And then, that is the total number of orbitals. What if you want to calculate the total number of electrons that can be held in each level? In each level. We know that each orbital can hold two electrons, meaning this s orbital can hold two electrons so we can have a total of two electrons coming to the level two in the level two each s orbital can hold two electrons and each p orbital can hold two electrons now that adds up to the total number of electrons and you can keep on adding the total number of electrons you're going to get each of these have two electrons so how much will you get in the next one and then for level four you should get a total of 32 electrons. So this is kind of a summary of things that we have uh, done over the uh, quantum numbers. All right. Now it is very important to know that two electrons cannot have the same set of uh, for quantum numbers. So quantum number for a given electron, if we define that quantum number with all four 
types of quantum numbers. We have uh, the first quantum number is n. The second one is L. Third one is ML. And the fourth one is the MS. Now, if we use all this set of numbers, it is like a unique chord. And two electrons cannot have the same uh, set of numbers. So it is like an identity. All right. So um, let's see if, if we can have uh, any quantum numbers that, that really cannot exist. For example, let's take um, the first something from here. Let's take uh, the level one quantum numbers. I can write it as N, L, M, L, and M, S. If I write it as one, zero, zero, plus half, this quantum number actually exists. Because you can see for the quantum number n equals one, the n equals one exists. And for that, l equals zero also exists. And the ml equals zero also exists. For everything, you can have a plus half or minus half. So that means this set of quantum numbers actually exist. We can say they are allowed. Now, if I write another set of quantum numbers like this, NL, ML, and MS as two, two, minus one, and plus half. Do you think it's going to exist? Will this exist? Let's take things one by one. Quantum number n. n2 can exist. So yes, this number can exist. But for n equals 2, will there be an L quantum number with number two. No, we cannot because L is zero to N minus one. So the only numbers you can have for N equals two is either zero or one. You cannot have two. So this second quantum number, this does not exist. So this chord is not an allowed chord, not so that means you cannot have an electron with that chord or with that set of quantum numbers. This is can not have electron with this set of quantum numbers. So just because we have a whole lot of numbers, that doesn't allow us to use them all. We can use only certain numbers of them. All right. So earlier, uh, we saw now right here. Right here, uh, you can see that we kind of build a relationship just by looking at n, the quantum, uh, the principal quantum number, you can tell how many total orbitals you're going to have in each level and how many total number of electrons you can actually get. So when you do certain uh, problems, knowing this shortcut is helpful. n squared will give you the total number of orbitals and if you look into uh, 
the other relationship uh, for the total number of electrons, you can say this is more like 2N2 type relationship. Do you see how that works? It's two, our N is one to two. So you get that given number of electrons. And let's add two and two for this. Two, our N is two, two to the power two, two to the power two is four, four multiply by two, you get eight. So these are like uh, very handy shortcuts when you're doing certain problems. Okay, so um, let's see if we can find the number of orbitals. Let's see if we can find the number of orbitals. when L is not finding the number of orbitals when L is not. Again, we can use a certain uh, shortcut to L plus one. I mean, if it is very hard to memorize all these things or, or keep in mind. You can use the old fashioned way to find how many uh, total number of electrons uh, you're going to have, a total number of orbitals you are going to have because when you have L, when you know the L, you know your ML is going to be minus L zero to plus L. So in any case, your L is, let's say two, it is minus two, minus one, zero, plus one and plus two. So you would get a total of five orbitals. You can do it either this way or you can use two L plus one. So again, we'll take L equals two. So two multiplied by L, which is two plus one, you get five. So one way, like what I have shown here, or the other way, like here, you can get the answer. So it depends how you can work it out. If you want, you can, uh, try to remember the 2L plus 1 as uh, a way to find the total number of orbitals when L is given. Next, uh, next we'll try to uh, bring all together uh, what we just did about the quantum numbers. We saw N is the principal quantum number which tells you about the level. You have your nucleus. These are the levels. And then L is about sublevel. Sublevels are like the orbitals and you can see their shapes. So when you have L equals zero, uh, you, you know that we are talking about S orbital. When L is one, we are talking about P orbital. 
L equals two, we are talking about D orbital, L equals three, we are talking about F orbitals. And then we learned about the ML, which can tells you a bit more about orbitals, like their orientation. And also you can get an idea about number of orbitals you will have. ML is taken by minus L, zero plus L. And I'll put a note for L, L is taken from zero to N minus one. All right, so for this, your ML can be equal to zero, meaning you have only one orbital. For L equals one, for the P orbitals, your ML is minus one, zero plus one, which is this set. Remember the box orbitals we drew? So we can basically put it like this. And for the D orbitals, you get minus two, minus one, zero, plus one and plus two. And these are that. And then for F orbital, you have minus three, minus two, minus one, zero, minus one. And then the spin, finally, the spin, quantum number, which is ms, we can kind of show with upward arrows, half arrows and downwards to say that they have opposite spins. So if you're showing this as the plus half, the opposite one can be identify as the minus half. So that means in each orbital, we said that there can be a maximum of two electrons. So that means I can put these electrons like this. And I can keep on doing it for everything else. But I guess now you know what we are doing here. So you can keep on doing that for everything. So you can see there is a unique set of quantum numbers for a given electron. So let's say I'm taking this, we look into the set of quantum numbers of this particular electron. You can see that this electron is located in the p orbital. We are trying to look into the set of quantum numbers that is n, l, m, l and m, s. You can see the electron we are trying to look into is in the p orbital and it is in the uh, plus one m, l box that I have labeled here. And let's say for a moment, we are looking at n equals two level. We know we don't have any p orbitals in n equals one. In n equals one, we have only s orbitals. Uh, p orbitals start appearing starting from the second level. So our quantum numbers are going to be n is 2, L is 1 because we are looking at p orbitals and our ML, you can see it is a plus 1 because I'm looking at this particular electron 
and since it is a downward zero I can put a minus half. What about the other electron in the same box? What would be the set of quantum numbers for that electron? Our n is still 2, l is still 1 because we are looking at the p orbital and uh, our ml is still plus 1 because we are still looking at the same box, the same p orbital, and, but uh, our spin is in the opposite direction, so it can be labeled as plus half. Now you can actually see that even though the two electrons are in the same orbital, they will end up with two different uh, set of quantum numbers. So basically, two electrons can not have same four quantum numbers. You can take any of these electrons and write the quantum numbers and check how they are going to change. You will never end up with two electrons with the same four quantum numbers. It's a question from uh, 2000, I think it's 2021. See if you can take a minute and uh, find the correct answer. The question asks, which of the following statement is incorrect with regard to an energy level of an atom with principal quantum number n equals 3. So when you have n equals 3, n means n is actually your level and the number of the level can actually show you the number of sublevels as well. So the, the n shows the level and also you can say that you have the same number of sublevels. How do you get that? We have looked at those things earlier. So we know that in, when, uh, when we have n equals 3, we have the same number of sublevels. And it says there are nine orbitals. 
and you can use the shortcut in square to get the number of orbitals, which is three to the square, which is nine. So you can say that the second statement is also correct. And the, the, the third statement is there can be a maximum of 18 electrons. And you can get the number of electrons, two and two, which is this, and you do get 18. So the third statement is also correct. And the fourth statement. Fourth statement, uh, there can be a maximum of 10 electrons with angular momentum quantum number L equals to two. So I showed you another type of uh, shortcut that you can use to L plus one will give you the total number of uh, orbitals you can have. And then each orbital can have two electrons. So this is asking not for the, the number of orbital, it's asking for the maximum number of electrons. So this gives you the number of orbitals, which is five, multiply it by two. So if you do two, 12 plus one, that will give you the number of electrons. So the fourth statement is also correct. So from there on, you can actually guess that the fifth one is the incorrect statement. So this one is the incorrect one that says there can be a maximum of eight electrons with magnetic quantum number, ML is uh, zero. So that is actually uh, not true because if your ML is zero, uh, for each you can have only a maximum of two electrons. All right, there's another question which quantum numbers are associated with the shape of an atomic orbital of the atom. What is associated with the shape is L. So it's this one. I think this is uh, 2018, I think, maybe. Okay. Next, um, next, next we'll uh, go into uh, some, some more uh, topics before going more practice problems, because in the exam, you don't get very simple type ones, like these ones are really simple, but you cannot always expect simpler ones like that. Sometimes they are combined together with another concept. So we'll check a little bit more concepts before doing uh, more practice problems. All right. So now we are going to work on uh, the electron configuration. In the electron configurations, uh, this comes with respect to the energies of the orbitals and how many electrons we will find in each orbital. So earlier we saw that energy level n equal one, it has only s orbital.
if you have n equals uh, two, we have s and p orbitals. And if we really consider about the relative energies of these orbitals, the s orbital has lower energy compared to p orbital. So that means p orbital has more energy than the s orbital. And in the n equals three, we have S, P, D, and we can show the increasing order of energies. P has more energy than S, and D is going to have more energy than P. So D is of more energy. You can keep on doing that for the other ones. Now, n equals four, we are going to have S, P, D, F. So our increasing order of energies is going to be of this. And then earlier we talked about the relative energies of each level. The level N1 is going to have the lowest energy. What that means is that S orbital of level one is kind of the lowest of lowest energies. So let's say if we have energy as this axis, upwards the energy increase, I can put my N1 here. And in that, I have only the S orbital. And the S orbital I have in level one, I can further label it as 1S instead of just S. And in level two, I have S and P. And now I know my S is of lower energy than P. So I have S. Because this S is on level two, I can label it as 2S. And I have three P's. And I mentioned earlier that P orbitals are degenerate. Now I'm coming into that. And I mentioned that degenerate means similar energies. And you know, we have three P orbitals. So if my Y axis marks energy, and if I mark three P orbitals like this, this is wrong because this, this doesn't show similar energies. That means the first P orbital is of lower energy than the second P and the third P. So this is a wrong way to show it. So what I'm going to do is that in order to show that the three P orbitals are of equal energy, I'm going to show it in the same line like that. So these are my two P orbitals. So one can be PX, the other one is the PY, and the other one is the PZ. And then going into the uh, energy level three. Now I have SPD. I can put my S 
since it is three, I can label it as three S and then I have the three P and then I have the three D. Again, this D is also degenerate. So that means all of my D orbitals, I can put them in the similar level. Things can get a little bit weird from this point onward. Now, if you recall, when we were uh, drawing the energy level for the line spectra, we drew the lines like this, N1 and N2, you have a certain distance. And as you go, these lines, these levels are going to close up. So from level three, N3 and onwards, this, these levels are kind of coming so close. So there is a little overlap going on. So what's going to happen is when it comes for uh, N4, there is a tiny mix up of this level, the S level of, now I, I will put this N a little bit lower. So n is equal to four. This S level belonging to level four actually falls between the 3P and 3D. So this is our 4S and then comes 3D and there goes our uh, 4P. And then you can find the 4D and so on. So because of that, when we have these energy uh, levels and orbitals filling up, we kind of have small mix up beyond level three. So this gives the foundation for our next concept, which is uh, the electron configuration writing. But this, this energy level diagram give rise to the alpha principle. We call it as the alpha principle. This word alpha comes from German saying that it is the building order, like building up. So when we are building it up, the levels with lowest energy is going to fill first. So you saw what the lowest of lowest is, the one S. The lowest energy level is N1 and the S orbital of that is like the lowest of lowest. So what is down below from here? What do you think is there? It's going to be the nucleus. That's what you have. So if anything is going to fill first, it is this. Fill with what? With electrons. So this level fills first with the electrons. And we know that one orbital can have a maximum two electrons. All these orbitals can have a maximum of two electrons. So when this level get filled with two electrons, if you have a third electron, the third electron needs to go the next lowest level. And let's see the fourth electron. 
it goes here. After that, the fifth electron don't have any more lower levels. So the fifth one must go there. So this is how the, the energy levels are going to fill up. And this is the building up order or the alpha principle. All right. So you can see that as we go on filling these energy levels, now we can fill the Py with electrons. Now we are going to look into more principles about this. And you can see as we build, after the 3P, we end up filling 4S. Now, the way we are writing this filling order is what we actually call as the electron uh, configuration. So let's say uh, we have 1S. Now we have two electrons here. So we can put it as two. Actually, we don't show it as EE. Instead, we show it as the half arrows. So we can, if we have an electron filling, let's say just one electron. First, we'll consider one electron. If we have one electron as shown here, we can write it as one S1. Now this is like uh, a sort of a, a symbolical language. This one shows you the level or the principal quantum number. And then this letter tells you which orbital you're looking at. And then the number, the superscript, that's going to tell you the number of electrons you have in that particular orbital. So this will tell you the number of electrons. So this is actually an electron configuration. 1s1 is an electron configuration. Let's say we have two electrons. Now I can write that electron configuration as 1s2 because I have things in the energy level one and my orbital is s and I have two electrons there. Okay. So here you might have noticed that I put my electron in the opposite spins and we are going to look into why I put it like this instead of putting it as two upside arrows. So we are going to look into why we did it the way we have done it. So this concept is actually called as the Pauli exclusion principle. In the Pauli exclusion principle, um, we, uh, we define it as uh, that electrons, that two electrons cannot have uh, the same four quantum numbers. two electrons cannot have a uh, same 
for quantum numbers. So let's say if you're taking a certain electron, uh, let's see if we can clear up, or maybe we can go to the next one. So let's say we have this energy level diagram. I have the level N equals one. I have this one S and then N equals two. I have the two S and two P. Now, if I have an electron in this level, I can write my four quantum numbers. The four quantum numbers are N, L, ML, and MS. So my N is level one and I have it in my S orbital. So my L is zero, ML is minus L through zero to plus L. So zero applying that, again, it's zero. And I can have my spin since I'm showing it upwards it's going to have a plus. So I would say this is the set of quantum numbers for my first electron. Now, what will happen if I put another electron with the same sign? I'm going to put another upward arrow. If I put a second upward arrow, I'm still in my level one. So my N is one, my L is zero because I'm still in S orbital. My ML is also zero. Now, since I put my uh, sign upward, I'm going to have the same quantum number. But the Pauli exclusion principle is going to say that two electrons cannot have the same four quantum numbers. Now I have got two electrons with the same quantum number, but according to this principle, I cannot have that. So what should I do? I have to make something different. So the only thing I can change is the spin. If I change other things, I'm pretty much changing the orbital or the energy level. So I can make a simple change by uh, putting the spin in the opposite direction like this. So now I can show it as the other quantum number. So uh, the take home message is that when you are filling up electrons, lowest level fills first. And when you pair up electrons, you have to align them in the spin opposite direction. So Pauli exclusion principle, in other words, you can keep it in mind as spin opposite. So if you switch the spin, you're going to have a different quantum number so that uh, the two electrons in the same orbital will not have the same four quantum numbers. All right. So now we can uh, have an idea about how this fails. And if you're going into the next energy level, you fail that level like this with one electron, and then you can have your second uh, 
electron. Now you can think of writing the quantum numbers for these given uh, electrons for the first one. What is your N? We have it in the second energy level. And then <clears throat> what is our L? You have S orbital. So our L is zero. If our L is zero, our ML, which is minus one, zero to plus one, that is also going to end up zero. And then you can have the MS, the plus half, and the other electron, you can have the minus half. And then you can do it for the next one. Still, you are in the uh, same energy level. So you can think about what your N is. N is still two. Your L is, you have P. So you're going to have one. You can have your ML as minus one, zero, and plus one. And if this is the minus one. And if we have an electron like that, I can write my quantum number as the minus one and my MS as a plus half. And also I can have a different electron if I have it in the other direction, then I can write the set of quantum numbers, again, to one, I can have the minus one and minus half. So you can see they can be in the same orbital but they're not going to have the same four quantum numbers. All right. So we have an idea about how to fill these uh, electron, electrons in the uh, given energy diagram. We fill the lowest energy levels and the lowest orbitals first. And if we had to pair up, we are going to do uh, in the spin opposite uh, direction. Now I want to um, introduce what uh, ground state is actually. Before going into that, all right. The electron filling order. I think I have filled things kind of mixed up, but anyways, we'll talk about uh, ground level uh, or the ground state in a while. But uh, earlier we saw the energy filling order, the way we given, you can see the energy axis. The energy is increasing upwards like that in the direction the arrow shows. This is one way we can show the filling order. If not, in some places, they show it like this. So in that case, your energies, you can show it uh, increasing downwards. So you can actually show your energy increasing uh, as you go down the energy increase. So when you write the electron configurations, you actually have to have an uh, idea about this 
actual filling order. So one way to do it is through practice. As you keep on practicing, you're going to remember this filling order as oneness, and then it goes to 2s, 2p3s, 3p4s. If not, you can actually build it up by looking at patterns. Even in this diagram, you can see that 1s, 2s, 3s, they are the consecutive numbers. So you can actually kind of write down the 1s, 2s, 3s, 4s like that. And then you can see the p orbitals or the p's. They don't start with one. You know that you don't have any p orbitals in level one. So it starts with two and it goes two, three, four, five, six, like that. And then you can write two uh, p, three p, four p, like that. And then look at the 3D. You, you don't have 3D on level one or level two. It starts with 3D and the 4F, it starts in the level four. And then you can actually draw some diagonal arrows, downwards diagonal arrows as shown here. And then what we have done here is connecting the arrow head to the tail of the previous one. So when you go and connect this arrow head to the tail, you can build. So it is very important that you know this filling order at least uh, into like uh, this 6S level. The first three levels are easy because it goes smooth but after a certain point uh, after 3p you will see that there is 4s popping up okay so next we are going to see how these electrons are going to fill up so when we fill the electrons, let's say we have hydrogen. Our atomic number is one. This is our Z value. So we know in the neutral atom, we have only uh, one electron, one electron and also one proton. So according to the alpha principle, we should get this single electron in the lowest possible level. So this is where we are going to put it. And our electron configuration for hydrogen, electron configuration, is going to be as 1s one and then earlier we looked into the uh, poly exclusion principle now when our uh, atomic number when our atomic number z value increase to two we are looking at the next element which is helium so for helium we have two electrons and you can see the energy gap between 1s and the 2s. 2s is a, a very high energy gap. This is a very high energy gap. So the second electron actually cannot go into a very high one. So instead, even though they are repelling, they will spend some energy to have opposite spins and organize like that. 
So the electron configuration for helium is going to be 1s2. And then if we keep on going, uh, filling these electrons, you can see how they are going to fill up. This is the atomic number one, atomic number two, atomic number three. Our next element is lithium. Lithium has atomic number three, three electrons. So our third electron goes to the lowest level because it's the next lowest energy orbital that is available. So our electron configuration can be written as 1s2 and 2s1. Remember our, this number tells us which energy level it is, the level. And the S tells you the orbital. And the superscript tells you about the number of electrons. Our next atom I'm going to look into is atomic number four, which is beryllium. Beryllium has another electron. That electron is also going to pair up like that. So the beryllium electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2. And the atomic number five, which is boron. We can put the next available lowest energy orbital. Now we have 1s2, 2s2, and we have the 2p1. Next, we are going to look into carbon. Now is we have a, a different problem. Where are we going to put our electron? Are we going to put it here like this? Or in the other one like this? So which option are we doing? Now to determine that, we can use another rule which we can call as the uh, Horn's rule. So how to determine where our next electron is going to go is uh, uh, determined by Horn's rule. Uh, in the Horn's rule, this is actually uh, defined as for degenerate orbitals, the lowest energy is attained when the number of electrons with same spin is maximized. For degenerate orbitals. So what are the degenerate orbitals? Things like 
2p. You have three orbitals with same energy. The lowest energy, now everything in the universe pretty much like to attain lowest energy because having a lowest energy is very stable. So in order to have that, it is uh, going to happen by maximizing the electrons with spins, uh, with the same spins. In, in simpler words, we can call Horn's rule as single occupancy. So that complicated statement, in simple word, we can say it as single occupancy. So what it means is that in order to have lowest energy, they are going to have same spin. So in the case of carbon, when we have six uh, electrons, when the atomic number is six, we have six electrons. Uh, now we have one, two, three, four, five. We had the problem with the sixth electron. So here it says have the same spin. Now, if we want to have same spin, we cannot be in the same box or the same orbital. So we have to go to the next available orbital. So this is same spin. So because they have same spin, they have to have a separate room for themselves, a separate orbital. So that is why they are occupying a different orbital because they both have the same energies. Just think about yourself. If you have to go, let's say you're going to university and you have to go to hostel and you don't like your roommate, you don't like your roommate, but on the other side, you have another room, the exact same size, exact, exact same cost. If you don't like your roommate, would you bother pairing up with the roommate? No, you're going to go to, a, to the other room because it doesn't cost anymore. See, there is no energy gap between the two P orbitals. So it, the electrons are pretty much like that. Electrons, they're negative charges. They kind of hate each other. So they don't like to pair up. So if there is any possibility, they will try to have their own space. Even having a spin opposite is going to cost a certain amount of energy. So in the cases, if, uh, if there is an energy cost, uh, like if there is no energy cost, they will not have spin opposite. Instead, they will have the same spin because the orbitals are going to be degenerate. All right. Now we saw the case with carbon. We can move on to the, uh, now we can lo uh, look into the electron configuration of carbon. The electron configuration of carbon is 1s2, 2s2, and now we have 2p2. And checking these electron configurations, what does this 1s2, does that recall any other electron configuration? If we go back, we have helium. Helium has 1s2. It's N1 energy level is complete. We consider helium. This is helium. It's N1 level complete. Having a complete level, energy level, complete means in the sense that all orbitals, available orbitals in, in that level are filled. So that completion results in unusual stability. So such 
elements become very stable. And we know helium is a noble gas. This is a noble gas. It is not going to react with anything. It's unreactive. Because it has completed its one level, trying to remove one electron from there is going to make the element, the atom unstable. So they're not willing to react. So we can see that 1s2 configuration in other atoms, see even in uh, lithium or beryllium. This part is actually the helium configuration. This part is helium configuration. So sometimes you can see a noble gas configuration within uh, another configuration. So in that case, we can shorten these electron configurations. So what, what you see here is the electron configuration of carbon. We can compress it using the helium configuration and write carbon configuration like this. So this is uh, the condensed electron configuration. We call this as the condensed electron configuration. Because we can simply replace a certain portion of the electron configuration with a noble gas configuration. We can take a look at a few more elements. Now we did carbon. We can now go and do nitrogen. Nitrogen uh, electron configuration, nitrogen atomic number is seven. So if we take the neutral atom, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So the electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, and 2p3. And then we have our next element, oxygen. Oxygen has eight electrons. Now, where do we put our eight electron? If we consider the energy gap between 2p and the 3s is again reasonably high. So it costs a lot of energy for oxygen to put an electron there. So instead of going there, oxygen will try to pair up electrons like this and have spin opposite arrangement. So this arrangement, having this uh, spin opposite, what is this principle? Is it Pauli exclusion principle or Horn's rule? Which one? It should be the Pauli exclusion principle because Pauli, remember, Pauli exclusion principle is about spin opposite. And Horn's rule 
is whenever possible having single occupancy. So for oxygen, you will have the mentioned type of electron filling. So your electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. And you can keep on filling like that if you want. You can replace this with helium and have the condensed electron configuration as helium 2s2, 2p4. And then for fluorine, you will have 1s2, 2s2, 2p5. So that is, you're going to have another one like that. And let's look at our next uh, noble gas, which is neon. What happens here in neon? 1s2, 2s2, we're going to have 2p6. And when you write these electron configurations, you will know that you have made a mistake if your numbers are not matching up. Neon, the neutral atom, will have 10, <clears throat> 10 electrons. And if you add these numbers, it should match whatever the number you have. And check fluorine. You have nine electrons. If your atom is neutral, add the superscript. When you add the superscript, it will match with the number of electrons in the neutral atom. Now we've looked into the neon, neon uh, electron configuration. This is neon. And for neon, you can see that the this level has become complete. This is N1 level, now N2 level. We earlier saw that helium can complete N1 level. Now when it completes the N2 level, we find helium doing that. So helium is also a noble gas. Now let's say you want to write the electron configuration of sodium. The next element you find in the periodic table is sodium with the atomic number 11. Now you can write the atomic number as 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, your next electron is going to be up here in the 3s. So it is 3s1. This is the expanded electron configuration. And you can have the condensed electron configuration now, like this. That's the condensed electron configuration. So remember, you're not going to put it as, if you write it as helium 2s2, 2p6, and 3s1, that is that is not very condensed. So this, this way is not that condensed. So we are using uh, the closest Nobel gas structure in the uh, the period in uh, in the above period in the periodic table. Okay. Next, next we are going to uh, look into uh, another representation of these orbital diagrams. I mentioned about the box orbital diagrams. So these 
electron filling or the electron orbitals, these, can, these things can be either shown in uh, energy level diagrams like this, or simply as box orbital diagrams. So if this is a box orbital diagram, where exactly is your energy axis? Where do you think your energy axis is? Your energy increase in this direction. So you have, you're starting with one S. So that means this is the lowest energy end. And this gap actually means the energy gap we had between 1s and the 2s. So whatever you had in the vertical direction, now we have flipped things in the horizontal direction. And here you see the 2p orbitals. They are degenerate. So they are like sticking together. There's no spaces between the p orbitals. So that is the box orbital diagram. Now, when you look into these diagrams and the, uh, the, the electron filling and also the condensed electron configurations that we went a while ago, we can locate them in this diagram. So for lithium, first take a look at lithium. In lithium, you have this pair of electron and it is the one level one and it is complete. And you can actually consider this part as the helium configuration. And what about the other electron singly standing there? Where is that electron? That electron is in the level two. The others were in level one. So your level one is like it's complete. So that makes this set of electrons those two electrons as the core electrons, it's core. They are in the core, inside. And what about the other electron that is left outside, which is this electron? We call it as the outer shell electron. And also we call this outer shell electrons as the valence electrons. So from the electron configuration of lithium, this 1s2 show the core electron and this shows the valence electrons. In lithium you have one valence electron. Next we can Look into something like, let's look into carbon. When you check carbon, you can again find the helium configuration here. So you have a certain complete level. So these two electrons 
become your core electrons. Core electrons are the ones that complete up to the noble gas structure. And that means these are going to be the valence electrons. So in that sense, carbon have four valence electrons. Can you think how many valence electrons boron have? Boron have three valence electrons. Beryllium, it has two valence electrons. Now these numbers are going to make a lot more sense. The number of valence electrons will make a lot more sense when we are going into learning more about the periodic table. They are all going to relate uh, at the end. And then uh, let's look at something like sodium. In sodium, this whole set is neon configuration. Neon completes the whole level two. So all these electrons are core. And this is your valence electron. Now, sodium has one valence electron. Now, if you go into the periodic table, you will see that lithium and sodium. You will find lithium and just below that, you will find sodium and see something common. They both have one valence electron. And if you have a periodic table that is numbered, you will even find this column where you have hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium labeled as group one. See, things relate. And if you check beryllium, beryllium has two valence electrons. What else will have two valence electrons is magnesium. If you go to the periodic table, you will find beryllium and magnesium like this. And if you have any numbering in the periodic table, you will find group two. Guess what they all have? They all have two valence electrons. So we are going to look into them uh, in details in our next lesson. Okay, so we are going to um, keep on doing this electron configuration. Now let's, uh, let's keep on working with this electron configurations. Now this is somewhat like the periodic table that you're going to get in your exam. And here you're going to see the N level. So you see hydrogen has only level one. Uh, things like lithium beryllium, they have level one and two. And when we wrote electron configuration, you can recall that hydrogen had the electron configuration 1, S, 1. So this 1 relate with that. And level 1 has only the S orbital. Helium was 1, S, 2. 
and then so the level n uh, n equals one it has only s orbitals n equals two we know it has s and p orbitals you can recall writing electron configuration for things like boron carbon this one for example if you take boron we had the electron configuration 1s2 now it has 2s2 and a 2p1 you don't have any any other letters like d f you don't have it so you have only s and p and when it come for the level three remember in level three you can have the orbitals s p and d but the thing is in the periodic table do you see any elements in this part you don't now there is a reason why they have left that space in the level three the elements they have d orbitals but they are all empty So that means when you write electron configuration for something like, let's say, aluminum. You will write it as 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2 and you have a 3p1 and also you have a 3d but it's empty it's a zero since it's a zero we just don't show it we don't have to show things that don't exist so we simply don't show it and then it's starting from level four that we actually start filling the D. So you have S, P, D, F. Now in this case, the F is empty. But starting from here, you will start filling the D orbital. This will be D1, D2, D3. Um, we'll go and see how these electron configurations are going to be like. Now we are going to look into uh, some electron configuration writing uh, from, let's do it from potassium and onwards. All right, so uh, if we do something like calcium. Now in the periodic table, what is the, your calcium is here. This is the calcium. I'm going to remove the other stuff. So that is calcium and it is on the period four or the level four. The period above it is the period three and what is the Nobel gas on the period three? You have argon. So when we write the electron configuration, we can use argon configuration uh, in order to write the condensed electron configuration. 
So we can write the electron configuration of calcium the long way as 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, and 4s2. Calcium has the atomic number 20. So when you add up this superscript, you should get 20. And this is the argon configuration. So in the condensed format, I can write it as argon and 4s2, that is calcium. Next element is scandium. I can write it as argon, uh, 4s2. Now I'm starting to fill the d orbitals. This is 3d1. This is D1. So it fills in this order. But in most places, when they write it, they will show it as argon. 3D1, 4S2. So do you see the difference? We wrote it as 4S2, 3D1. That is how it fills. First the 4S fills and then the 3D. But when we write it, we just write it as 3D1, 4S. But remember the 4S fills first. All right. The next element is titanium. I can write it as argon. It fills as 4s2, 3d2, but I can write it as argon, 3d2, 4s2. And then the next element is vanadium. Again, I can write it as 4s2, 3d3 as it fills, but I can write it as 3d3, 4s2. Next comes the issue, chromium. Now this is kind of a favorite part when they come to test. When you write chromium, you might follow the same trend that we were writing. You can put argon, 4s2, and you might write 3d4. But this kind of a configuration does not exist for chromium. What we write for chromium is not this. What we write for chromium is argon, Boris 2, uh, sorry, Boris 1, three D five. Now this might look weird. Instead of putting Boris 2, three D four. We have moved one electron from here into there and turn that into a 3D5 and leave it as 4S1. Why do we do it like that? Now, if we do the uh, box diagram for chromium, we have the 
argon structure. So I'm not going to uh, draw it. After that, we have, let's put, this is the 3D forex. Maybe I'll put it in the filling order. I was putting this in the writing order. I'll rather put it in the um, in the filling order. Our four S fills first. And then we have the 3D. So if we go ahead and fill it the way I showed first, like this. If I fill it like that, my electron configuration is going to look like this. But if I do it in a different way, As the second bit, this is what I'm going to get. This is the first way of doing it, and this is the second way of doing it for chromium. Now, when you look into these two sets of boxes, that you can see in the second set of box, they're pretty much all half filled. They are like complete half filled. Now this is going to bring in a kind of unusual stability. This is like a precise half situation. And this brings stability. Now everything want to be stable. They want to have minimum energy, they want to be stable. And that is why chromium does not exist in this 4S2 3D4. So it does not exist in this way. Instead, it exists in the way that I have written below. So its electron configuration is going to be argon, forest one, 3D, now, if you keep on doing that, you will find a similar kind of thing happening in copper as well. See if you can write the electron configuration for copper. The Nobel gas in the previous period is argon. You will expect it to have a 3D 
nine forest two, that is you may expect. But what you're going to have is instead a 3D 10 and a forest one. This is the reality. The actual electron configuration is 3D10, forest one, not the other way around. All right. Just to uh, complete what we have learned so far, we'll see if we can do uh, additional couple of questions from previous papers. This one is from in 2020. It's asking for the number of electrons in the manganese atom that have the quantum numbers L equals zero and ML minus one. Now, where do you even start? I would just look at the electron configuration. We just did electron configurations and it gives you the atomic number. So you can think of the electron configuration of manganese, which is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, and 4s2, 3d5. If you want, you can write it the other way as well. If you want, you can write it as 3d5, 4s2. Now, what is L equals zero? L equals zero? We are talking about S orbitals. What are the S orbitals in this configuration? This is S, this is S, that's S, and this is S. What is the total number of electrons in all these S orbitals? two, four, six, eight. So you have a total of eight electrons in that. And the next one is ML equals minus one. When this is the case, you might want to think about what gives this ML minus one. When you have S, for S, this ML would be zero. If you can recall the P orbitals, where L is equal one, ML goes from minus one, zero to plus one. So if you think about this 2p6, you have minus one, zero, plus one. And in that, you have how many electrons? One, two, three, four, five, six. So here you have a minus one with two electrons. Are there any more like that? You have one here for 3p. This is a minus one, zero, a plus one. And check the electron configuration. It's a 3p6. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six. So again, 
in the minus one, you have two more electrons. And is there anything else? What about D? This is minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, plus two. And you have five D electrons. That's one, two, three, four, five. So in the minus one, you again have an electron there. So what is the total number of electrons in this ML equal minus one, you have two, four, five. You have a five. So in S orbital, you have eight and ML five. So what is your answer? That is going to be your answer, the option number three. So these are actually very easy scores you can get. And the next question, the maximum number of electron pairs associated with the principal quantum number n equals three. So if you check the number of orbitals, n squared, three squared, that gives you nine. That is the total number of orbitals. And each orbital, you have to know each orbital can contain a maximum of electron pair. So it's going to be 18 electrons. 18 electrons mean actually nine pairs. So you're going to have only nine pairs of uh, electrons. Now this is a question from the structured essay. I think it is uh, 2019. So you have to fill in the boxes, find what your N, L or what your ML is. This was a question with six points and this is actually very easy six points. How do you solve with this? Here you can see 3P. The first one you, you see 3P and you have to know this number actually represent N. So immediately you know what your N is. Your N is three. And what's here, it's P. For P, you have to have your L equal one. Remember L equals zero, you get S, L equals one, you get P, L equals two, you have D. So your L is one here. And in the second one, in the second one, second one, you can see the N, N is three. So in the atomic orbital, it is three something. And you see your L as two, L2 is the D. So this is three D. Next one, in the third part, again, you have two S. When you see this two, you immediately know which level you're talking about. So your N, or the principal quantum number is two. And this is S meaning L is equal to zero. And ML, you know how to get ML. And for S, ML is going to be also zero. So very easy questions. And if you check the previous papers, you will see that in recent years, pretty much every year, there was at least one question from these 
quantum numbers. So sometimes they can be very straightforward, uh, but the other times they can be uh, much more complicated and combined with uh, another concept. So we are going to stop 